Good evening. I'm Greer McGeary, President of Seahorse Victoria. And tonight I have a very special guest, Rosemary Langdon, who was the founding president of Seahorse Australia in 1971. Welcome, Rosemary. Thank you very much for the welcome. I much appreciate it. I've always got a very fond memory of Victoria. It was, in fact, my mother's uh, birth state. Before we discuss anything about uh, Seahorse and the anniversaries, because next year is the 50th anniversary of uh, founding uh, Seahorse Australia, which eventually became Seahorse Society of New South Wales and Seahorse Victoria and Seahorse Queensland. And this year is the 45th anniversary of Victoria. But I'd like to talk about uh, your personal journey from uh, your earliest memories, uh, growing up in uh, the UK from uh, through the war and to when you first started to realise that you uh, liked to dress and um, the journey from there. My earliest memories was when I was about 10. I was at a boarding school in the south of England, boys' board boarding school, and it was during the war, it was about 1941 or 42. Britain was engaged in a life and death struggle with Nazi Germany, and I knew that what I wanted to do was not going to be very popular. So I kept it to myself. I knew from day one, in actual fact, that I had this compelling urge to dress in women's clothes, and in fact wished I was a woman at that point. It would have made everything so much easier. But I knew it was not to be, so I kept it very quiet. When you um, sort of realised that you needed to keep it very quiet, uh, and you're talking about those early years of the, the war in the UK, obviously um, family and uh, society was pretty traumatised. Um, what sort of impact did that play upon where you were at the boarding school? When I went to the boarding school, I had a terrible stutter. And uh, I, was, of course, was bullied, but I soon discovered that you could overcome this very quickly with half a dozen blows to the appropriate part of the body, and the bully would then decide there were other people easier to bully than myself, and I was left alone. I won't say I was the most popular boy, but I was not bullied as such. But I knew if anyone discovered that I was happier in wearing a dress and wearing trousers, it would start all over again, and I didn't wish to create problems for myself. Uh, with Also, the expectation was that all young boys would grow up to young men and join in the fight against Hitler, except for mothers, except the mothers of the boys. They didn't want to see their children killed, but everybody else wanted to see everybody else in. But um, I was only eight, I was, only, uh, I was born in, I was a depression baby, born in 31, so... In 1941, I was only 10, and the war had ended in England before I went on to my secondary school. Obviously, schooling, and then you're going into your secondary schooling. Um, you know, the, that war, we obviously know that was very traumatic, but uh, how did secondary school uh, and your desire or your urge to dress um, combine? Well, I have to regretfully state that I still kept it secret. My one thing was to find somebody else. I couldn't understand why I was the only man or boy in the world that had this terrible desire and felt from all the time that there must be somebody else. But where were these mysterious people with this urge? I couldn't find. I chased around. When I was at, at my secondary school, I did discover two very vital things. One, that my complaint was called transvestism, which had been coined by Magnus Hirschfeld at the end of the 19th century. And secondly, I was not alone. For this, I have to thank a Sunday newspaper called The News of the World, which had a reputation for two things. One was accurate and full reporting of sporting events. And secondly, a portion for recording titillating sexual cases which went before the courts. And, of course, nothing is more titillating than men who, or boys or who steal washing off lines and they were regularly reported. Everyone thought it was for masturbation, but I knew that there was, among those theft thieves were, in fact, my fellow transvestites. 
progressing beyond the school, you know, because now it's post-war and mm. uh, you're getting into the rebuilding of uh, the UK and that. So the, the personal circumstance, you know, the, the living arrangements, the general society, what was that like at the time? It was not good. I, um, Britain won the war. But to win it, they were totally bankrupt of themselves. It wore out all the machinery. And in fact, rationing after the war was more severe than during the war. I was 13 at the time, and uh, I relied heavily on potatoes and bread to fill myself up. And I, wouldn't, I didn't come from a poor background. We were all in the same boat. And even those became rationed for a time in 1946. And it wasn't really until I left school at the end of 49, and of course I was immediately called up, uh, that uh, things began to slightly improve in 1950 and 51. I, of course, was, uh, when I was called up, national service in England was absolutely comprehensive. Everybody did it, from the dustman to the Dutch to the Duke's son. And consequently, they had a large number of people every fortnight to sort out. And one of the things they had to do was to sort out, I went in the gunners, to sort out who were potential officers and senior NCOs and who were the hoi polloi. And they did this by a very simple device. They asked you whether you played soccer or rugby. If you played rugby, you were a potential officer. If you played soccer, you were a potential other rank. Now, this sounds very strange, but you must realize that the public schools, which are in fact the private schools, which were originally designed to educate the public, uh, all played rugby with a, with a few exceptions. And the, all the grammar schools, which were the educated uh, pri uh, public schools, played rugby too. The others played soccer. So very quickly, in one, uh, ten, one two minutes, you could separate most of the potential officers. The worst are, however, some glorious exceptions. Just to, as an aside, I remember uh, in my original career in aviation communications, seeing a, a note where um, a senior pilot for a major airline back in the early 70s said, oh, he split up all the applications into two piles and then flipped a coin and threw one lot out and, and said, well, if they're that well, unlucky, <laughs> I don't want them. So well, this, it sounds a similar sort of process. This was very effective and it offended nobody. But um, there was an exception. Our school was one. The El Carthusians had the honour of winning the FA Cup. That's the cup that's fought for every year by Manchester United and others. I agree over 100 years ago. And also the Amateur Football Association Club, which they won again 100 years, but they also won it again last year. So there's a very strong soccer tradition in their school. So I went off and joined the Hoi Polloi. With um, the homosexuality was illegal, much the same as many places in the world. You know, we've seen in recent years with um, the story of Alan Turing and um, with the, his uh, Turing machine, which is eventually the basis for most of our modern day computers. I, I understand that would have been in the early 50s uh, when he was publicly humiliated. And it was a horrific situation. I'm afraid that the New South Wales Police Force was no better. Uh, I am glad to see those days are, be, be, are behind us, and I hope they never come back. He was honoured later by his, his portrait was put on the... Um, I think the ten pound note, which I think is a, a fine tribute to a person who was in fact vilified during his life. You'd mentioned about being in the gunners, so did that take you around the world and where if so, where did you end up? Well I was selected for officer training and I went to Mons Officer Cadet School at Aldershot and it was there that I thought I'd better discover a bit more about Rosemary. I tried every public library, but the mention of the word sex and the librarian nearly fell, fell over backwards. And I felt that the only way I could get the information was by going to a public library of a university town. So I went to the nearest university town to Aldershot, which is Reading, went there, looked up sex and my delight. I found there was 
book by Havelock Ellis, The Psychology of Sex, looked it up, found no mention of transvestism, but there was a mention of aeonism. And then I remembered Chevalier Deon, who was a courtier in the court of King Louis XIV, who was sent by him to uh, improve the relations between France and Russia. And he went to the court of uh, Catherine the Great. He went dressed as a lady and was very successful. When he came back, the usual reward, which was given to him, which, but he had to stay dressed as a girl, for a lady, for the rest of his life, which he did. So I looked that up, found the scene to cover me. Then I saw another book that said, Cases in the Psychology of Sex by the same person. And that definitely fixed it. The only difference between these worthy young men at the turn of the 19th century and me was they were obsessed with tight lacing, which was hardly surprising, bearing in mind they it was the done thing for the ladies at that time. So obviously you, you're somebody who really made an effort to research um, where you were at and uh, kind of noting that it was uh, termed as transvestism. You know, once you've done this research and then were you able to be more open about yourself? Not a hope in hell. For two reasons. One, that 95% uh, of the population of England had no idea what the word transvestism was anyway. Uh, as far as they were concerned, you were either heterosexual or homosexual. And if you dressed as a woman, you were homosexual. Therefore, I kept it very quiet right through that time. In your journey with the army, uh, did you end up uh, moving overseas? As soon as I was commissioned, I was sent to join the forces in Malaya against the bandits, which was since been known as the National Servicemen's War, because most of it was fought by national servicemen. I did uh, a year there. I won't say that I spent much time in the jungle, because the artillery does not go in the jungle. But I did do a few sweeps. When I had finished my uh, service in Malaya, I came back to England, complete, I'm glad to say, with two rather lovely slips and a pair of high heel sandals, which, which I felt I could slip back without exciting the customs if they did open my baggage. So wh while you were in uh, Malaya, there, were you able to uh, explore or uh, find out more about uh, transvestism and uh, cross-dressing? I didn't do it. I was a, a lowly subaltern, and uh, I had to be awfully careful what I did. I, the, as far as I went was literally to buy these three pieces of clothing and a pair of nylons uh, so I could wear my sandals. But it was done in the privacy of my room, and I knew again that if I ever mentioned it to anyone, it would make my life miserable. And life was not in it. You don't make life difficult for yourself unless you really are stupid, which I hope I'm not. But uh, when I returned to England, by sea, by the way, those were before the days of air transportation, uh, I uh, then went to University of London to begin my training. So what did you train as at the university? Everything was a bit mixed up in those days. In fact, in many ways, it was better. I'm a property man is the best way of describing it, and the English qualification is a member of the Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Um, and they had two ways in. One was university, which was only done by a very, very, very small um, a number of people. And you could only do it at Cambridge and um, London, the College of Management. Or alternatively, you could have two years full-time study, uh, and then you took two examinations by the institution. They weren't giveaways. They hit on the other uh, best way of reducing the number of people who qualified was to fail two thirds of everyone who took the exam every year at all exams. So you had a first examination, they failed two thirds after one year, the intermediate examination where they failed two thirds, and then you had to work and take evening classes or study 
and take the final exam, well, they again failed two thirds. Now that you've sort of got through a career, um, had you left the army at that point or uh, were you still um, in the army? Unfortunately, when I was in the army, an idiot in North Korea decided that he wanted to capture South Korea and the British government promptly increased my 18 month service to two years and to make sure I liked it, gave me another five years part-time service in the Territorial Reserve, as it's now called. So I was in the army, but it was very useful. I had no money, and the army pay for camp was very, very good as far as I was concerned, and paid for a lot of my luxuries, such as a wig or a few dresses or other essentials of life, which I did do when I was living in London. And aside there, you talked about buying wig and other clothing. Is it, um, What was the reaction from those play, uh, businesses that where you did go in to buy you know, items such as wigs and clothes, obviously it would be, be, appear to be for yourself. Universally, I've never had any trouble with buying clothing. The only, uh, the only firm in the whole world that ever queried me buying was in fact farmers in the city. When I was rummaging through the lingerie bin in the sale, the lady in charge got very upset that I was doing it. She has the honour, and I must have been into a thousand shops, of who having been the only person who objected to me. Most of the others were very helpful. All they wanted to do was to make a sale. Back in the, the 50, 50s, I would have thought that that might have been a bit of a, an issue, but obviously not. Now, moving on, you, you've you know, got a university degree, and uh, so meeting a partner or meeting somebody that you'd like to spend time with, um, how did that go? I, actual fact, discovered a very important thing in life, girls. Before that, I'd lived a very cloistered life. My, I was one of a family of three boys, and uh, there weren't any parties during the war or after the war, so I never really knew much about girls. But when I went to university, I discovered they were wonderful people and I had a glorious time. And uh, I didn't discuss my female uh, desires, though I did envy them. And they had the most wonderful dresses in 1950. Those were the dresses that go out sideways. My granddaughter yeah. wanted to borrow one of mine, but I told her very recently that you couldn't have it because I was still wearing it, but I would make her one, which I did. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, it, it's amazing how fashion can come around in circles. Oh, God, yeah. When did you first uh, meet your life partner? I met my life partner soon after I qualified. By that time, I had graduated from a motorbike, which is just as well as she had a disastrous habit of turning the opposite way when you went round a corner, which would have, put, would have put you in the head without any trouble at all to a motor car. I agree it's not the best of me. It was a 1937 Ford 8, and you could see the road underneath you. And when it rained, you had to put an umbrella up, bearing in mind it was a saloon car. You can see it wasn't very waterproof, but it got me around, and it got her around. And we had a very fine time. As I said, she had lots of boyfriends. I eventually had to make my mind up, so I proposed. She, and she, of course, accepted, but there was a proviso, as always, with my dear wife. We get the hell out of England as soon as we possibly can. She was born in East Africa, educated in, in Kenya, and I didn't think much of the English weather. So I accepted that. It didn't worry me. When I was in Malaya, I had met up with fellow officers who had been in Hong Kong, among other places, and that seemed to be a good place to have a go at. She also suggested I try the colonial office. Her father was a commissioner of mines in Tanganyika and she thought it was a good career. So I went and applied for a job. Hong Kong seemed the best of the boat, of the available. So I put my application in and went off to do my camp. Once you start doing military service part-time, you continue with it. As I said, the money was good and you enjoyed the comradeship of your fellow officers. At what point did you um, start to tell your wife um, about your uh, urge and your transvestism? 
to I have to regretfully state that I only told her about a couple of years after marriage that I like so many other transvestites uh, or cross-dressers had hoped and believed that once I got a real wife when I could have sex with her rather than in my imagination that Rosemary and all her uh, desires would go away and as we all found it doesn't and it was then when it came back then I had to tell Jennifer which I did. Did she sort of show any signs at the time when you told her of um, maybe wanting it to disappear or was she much more accepting? Um, she was a nurse and nurses are very sympathetic. They have all kinds of people they have to look after and she, and, uh, she realised, I think, from a very early stage that it was part of me, it was part of the man she loved. And by that time we were in Hong Kong and uh, it wasn't the place to make life, make ways. So uh, we came to a, a, a conclusion. Her main problem was not that she was disliked it, but she was terrified of someone finding out and embarrassing her. That was her only view. So we, I came to uh, an arrangement with her that I would do, keep, not embarrass her, and keep her um, happy. And she would let me dress in my in our own house, which is what I did. But I had yet to meet another transvestite. How did you find life in Hong Kong compared to what you'd grown up with and uh, in England and the um, being in the army? Well, you must realise I come from a colonial family and that it was perfectly normal for children to leave their family homes and go overseas in one place or another. We have a, an interesting career, an interesting background. In my my great-grandfather fought his uncle. He was in the British fleet that burnt down the White House and my uncle married the stepdaughter of George Washington so you could see they weren't on the same sides and I hope it doesn't happen again because my granddaughter uh, is about to become an officer in the British Army and her brother is, is an, an officer in the Royal Australian Navy so I hope to God the two countries don't declare war Otherwise, it could be very difficult. What you have to realize is that it's difficult now that when you went overseas, you went overseas for a tour of three and a half years. You had no leave of any, because you couldn't afford to go anywhere when you went to Hong Kong. The, the biggest place you would go to was Macau, and then you only went about a couple of times. So you were very heavily dependent upon your fellow colleagues, and, uh, and you were expected to knuckle down and do everything that was necessary and the wives helped the wives uh, particularly as most of, most of the wives had their first child while they were in Hong Kong but uh, I had a an interesting time I don't really want to get too heavily involved except to say that uh, I was given a job when I went there solely because nobody else in the department would take it was to try and sort out the new territories for the property wise and everyone knew it was going to be a bloody awful job so they kept clear of it until finally the government said we'll send the next person out who gets off the boat before he knows what's happened we'll send him out there and you can guess who that was i understand then you met some uh, a couple of interesting people from america i met them later what happened what i was still continuing my search for the mysterious transvestite and when I arrived in Hong Kong, I discovered that there was a book called, a magazine called Psycho Sexology, which was very similar to Forum down here. And it was available for sale in the bookshops in the alleys of Hong Kong. And I think they were just shipped in bulk and they were just sold off. But this did have articles from time to time on transvestism. So I used to buy a copy and quickly whip through to see if anything there of interest. On one occasion, I saw there was a, um, a certain Dr. Virginia Prince who was about to publish a magazine for transvestites. This, to me, was wonderful. I had bought some dirty books in Soho in England, 
these were hand typewritten, believe it or not. So they only could do six copies at a time, and the price was accordingly that high. And they covered everything. In order to get the maximum market, they covered every known variation you could think of in every book. It was quite an achievement of writing to be able to do this. But they weren't really very good. But I thought this was too good to be true, so I wrote to Sexology, got Virginia's um, uh, name and address, wrote to her and ordered the, the first copy. Uh, it was, in fact, issue number nine, and I was delighted when it arrived. It was everything I wanted. Well written by fellow transvestites who were educated. It wasn't pornographic under any circumstances. And, uh, and then I, then was the next big incident in my life was I noticed at the back of this magazine that there was a contact section. So I thought, well, if I can't meet anybody, at least I can have a pen pal. So I wrote to one that went through Virginia. She sort of made certain there was no uh, pornographic thing, what I had written. And I waited. A month later, I was asked to go and see the district commissioner, which didn't worry me particularly, because after the troubles I'd had in trying to persuade the new territory villagers to pay their taxes. Um, but when I arrived, I noticed there was a man behind him who I didn't recognize, and he opened a file, took out a letter, and handed it to me. And to my horror, I saw it was a letter I'd written which had been written in handwriting, so there was no way I could deny it. I came to the conclusion that attack was the best form of defense. So I said, so, well, I said, I am a transvestite. I'm a heterosexual. My wife knows about it, and it isn't illegal. And I had the good fortune to have one of the really fine people in the world. And he knew what I said was correct. And because I had done this job, very efficiently before, he didn't want to lose me. So he asked me, by the way, the man behind him was the director of health, who was nowhere near as friendly as my bloody boss. He had a kind of cynical look on his face that didn't impress me at all. He asked me whether I would undergo psychiatric treatment. I said yes, knowing there wasn't a hope in hell of curing me. I only hoped that they weren't going into inflict the aversion treatment, which was still going strong at the time. I, for those who don't know, it's a sort of humanized version of Pavlov's dogs, where they inject you with, with to make you ill and then show you a dress. Really barbaric. Anyway, I uh, said, yes. He said, I won't put your, anything in your records if you do it. I said, fine, it sounded me a bit and although I didn't entirely believe him, I did discover later on, as you, from my friends in Special Branch or TVs, that he, he, he kept his word. There was no mention in Special Branch records of me, and he did, he did what he said he was going to do. As you said, you had a, a very understanding uh, boss uh, and um, somebody who, while might have been a bit cynical and... Uh, that did actually keep his word. So from that experience, uh, what was your next part of um, your life in Hong Kong and or what happened after that? By that time, our marriage was going very strongly. She was upset, and so was I. Um, anyway, we went to the psychiatrist who decided that the only cure was, he didn't do anything about transvestism, so I had to give him a quick course, which I did. And then he, he decided to give me uh, Stobistol, which is an artificial female hormone. I didn't know what it was. I, didn't, I wasn't well versed in this matter. But as soon as I got home and told my dear wife, she hit the roof. She knew exactly what Stobistol was. And said, we're well, not having you taking that, dear. I do not want my wife castrated chemically or otherwise. So I went back and told the doctor, dear doctor, that it wasn't on. Of course, he couldn't compel me because... What I said to Ronnie Holmes, the district commissioner, was true. I had not broken any rule or regulation. It was just embarrassing that I was a transvestite. Anyway, he gave me another pill, 
I didn't tell me what it was. I went to work, went to work, uh, had my usual lunch with a glass of beer, I mean a glass, and then found I was roaring drunk and realized that the pool should have had a caveat saying under no circumstances are you to take alcohol. I went back to him and told him it wasn't on. And he said, I don't know what to do. And so I said, well, how about you writing a note to the district commissioner telling him I'm cured? He said, all right, I'll do that. So I'm one of the few successful cures of transvestism. <laughs> And uh, that was the end. It's that was the end of it. I, That's uh, a lovely story there. Um, so, you know, you, you, you're now being cured. Were you in Hong Kong for much longer? Uh, or did you? I had the, I, was coming up, I was coming up to the end of my first tour, and I persuaded my dear wife that perhaps it might be a good idea to go through America. I now had, a, having had this experience, I knew all the girls. <laughs> 